Welcome back, my happy crumbers, and welcome to Happy Grumpin' Wargaming. I have a question for you all today. Is going second too strong? The answer might be a little bit surprising. Let's find out today. All right, guys, so we're asking the question, is going second in Warhammer 40,000 too dang strong? Well, is this Sailor Orc too dang strong? The answer is yes, Sailor Orc is crazy too strong, and it's overpowered, and we should not allow that madness. All right, so let's break it down. Secret missions are brutally powerful for certain armies. I'm especially thinking your uppy downy armies. So your things like Hypercrypt Necrons, your Grey Knights, your, um, oh, jeez. Whatever, your uppy downy armies. Traditionally, going first has been an extreme advantage in 40k. This is like when we're talking, say, 9th edition, back in even further back. So it's it's always been you wanted to go first. And a lot of times whoever went first just kind of won the game. It's it a little nonsense. Now, 10th edition has really changed this. And Pariah Nexus in particular has changed this even more. So when we look at the primary missions in Pariah Nexus, these are actually very biased towards going second. So what we're doing in this video today is I'm going to be breaking down why going second is too strong, and I'm going to be offering solutions on how we can fix it. And if you're not taking advantage of some of the reasons why going second is really strong, well, this video is going to be able to help you <laughs> fix your game plans. All right. So secret missions in particular are exceptionally biased towards going second. We're going to break all that down. Let's get into it. Primary. So Prime Nexus, we're going to talk about what are the primary missions where going second is a huge advantage. Now, I think it is really important to note that score when you score at the end of your command fit, at the end of your turn in round five when you go second, that is a massive advantage all the time. Because what it tells you is that in round four, if you went second, you can just get off all of the objectives. Meaning you're not standing in the open if the no man's land objectives are in the open. You're not going to be exposing you yourself unnecessarily because you could just walk right off of them. Then your opponent's turn five, they might not have any targets. And then in your turn five, you get to go back onto the objectives and then score because you don't score at the beginning of the command phase when you go second in the last round. That is a massive advantage right there. But then there are specific missions that going second even dramatically further is advantaged so let's talk about the ritual in the ritual this is the mission where there's only one objective in the center and everyone is making objectives so when you go second you actually have the ability to make one two objectives and then you can deny your opponent's primary scoring much more easily because they're going to be having to stand on their objectives in turn one which gives you the opportunity to actually get onto it to deny them that scoring. In turn two, you have the ability to get onto their second objective to drop them down to a five. So it makes it much easier for you to do to, to deny their primary. Meanwhile, and we're gonna give you a little bit of a preview of this later, at the end of the game, you can make another objective and then you can score at the end of your turn. So this is a massive advantage going second in the ritual. Supply drop. Supply drop by its nature is always gonna be biased towards who goes second because you only score five victory points on objectives in no man's land. Then in round four, the two objectives that remain, you can score eight points for. And then in round five, the one that remains, you score 15 objective points or 15 primary points for. Typically, supply drop, whoever holds that one objective at the end of the game is the one who wins the objective at or who wins the game. So in going when you go in second, you can focus everything you have on simply denying your opponent the ability to hold that last secondary in their round five and then in you have an entire turn to move your entire army onto it at the end of your turn in round five so it makes it much easier to get those 15 points which can be a massive 30 point swing because if you can just very easily deny your opponent that holding that objective in their round five and then suddenly you uh get to score in round five that is a 30 point swing in the last round of the game which is dramatic so which is why when you go second on supply drop you're probably going to win. Then we have Lynchpin, which might even be worse than Supply Drop. Lynchpin, there is no cap on the amount of primary that you can score. So you can score 23 primary points in round five. And is and you technically can do this when you go first as well, but it makes it a heck of a lot easier in when you go second, seeing as at the end of the turn is when you got to be on the objectives, not at the start of the turn. So you can get five for each objective in no man's land, which is typically typically going to be uh, 15 points you can get three for your homeland home uh, uh your objective and no man or your home field objective excuse me sorry which is going to be three points so that puts you up to 18 points and you get five for holding your opponent's objective as well or six actually uh, i forget anyway you can get like 23 primary points scored so 
There we go. These missions love going second. Let's talk about the missions that like going first. Burn of Trust is probably the only objective that gives you, well, all right, Terraform, there's a, there's an argument for it too. So Burn of Trust gives you four opportunities to score your guarded objective versus three opportunities if you go second, because you're, if you go first, you can score at the end of round two, you can score at the end of round three, four, or five. When you go second, you're only allowed to score the Burn of Trust if you go in rounds three, four, and five. So you just have more opportunities to rack up the primary points. So you do get an advantage uh, when you go first in Burn of Trust. And then Terraform is kind of a toss up. I would say it's still a little bit of an, object of an advantage to who goes first, because if you Terraform the objective, your opponent then can't Terraform the objective, which is kind of a big deal as well. So let's talk about these freaking secret missions, because these are the things that are really busting going second. And then I'm going to talk about how we fix it and what like the best way to do it is. So secret missions. Mission number one, you have the command insertion. Your war or, you know, before I get into this, let me just break down how you score a secret mission. Round three, at the end of round three, if you are tied on primary or you are down in primary, then you get to choose a secret mission. And it's secret because you don't tell your opponent what it is. Now, the way secret missions are scored is at the end of the game, you if you successfully complete your secret mission, you will score 20 victory points for that. The downside is you are capped at 20 victory points for primary. So you can no longer score 50 victory points on primary. You can only score 40. 20 for the secret mission and 20 for the primary itself. All right. Now, this is typically not a problem because it is very rare to be able to score max primary on any mission. So typically what people will do, especially when you talk about, say, the ritual, if you're going second, you'll just always choose a secret mission and you'll just make sure that no matter what, your opponent is ahead of you in primary in round three. And then you're going to choose to hold one, three objectives, two, three objectives in no man's land at the end of the game, which is more or less a guaranteed 35 point swing. And if you've already scored five points, you've maxed your primary off of that. And there's nothing your opponent can do to stop you. It gets really strong. So let's read what the secret missions are. You've got command insertion. This is your warlord is within range of the objective marker in your opponent's deployment zone that you being the player with the warlord control. If you go second, this is really easy because at the end of the game. So if you have a warlord and you have access to uppy downy, like it's hyper crypt. If you have Angron and Angron comes back when you are playing world eaters, you get the ability to move on to the objective. Uh, if you're playing Blood Angels and you have the Uppy Downy Detachment, although trust me, that detachment's not good, which is really sad to me. I really wish it was. It could be good if the Sanguinary Guard drop in points dramatically. So I'm not writing off quite yet. Anyway, then, then we have Shatter Cohesion. Now, this is the second secret mission. There are no units from your opponent's army on the battlefield. So you table your opponent or... Every unit from your opponent's army that is on the battlefield is either battle-shocked, below half strength, or more than three inches away from all objective markers. This one tends to be a lot harder, um, and you just typically don't see people choose this. Then we have Unbroken Wall. This is the one I was talking that about, which works amazingly specifically on the ritual, where you control three or more objective markers that are not within your deployment zone. During the ritual, you can just straight up make five objective markers, and your opponent might not have enough units to be everywhere. And especially if you went second, you can make that objective marker at the end of the of round five, which means, holy crap, you just scored that secret mission. And there's basically nothing anyone can do about it. And then lastly, we have uh, the War of Attrition, which is one or more battle line units from your army are within your opponent's deployment zone. And one of the following conditions applies. Either there are no battle line units from your opponent's army on the battlefield, or every battle line unit from your opponent's army is also within their deployment zone. So either way, you can make that work. This is insanely powerful for our armies like your Hypercrypt Necrons, your, your Grey Knights as well, who just have the battle line units that can just always pop back there. It's also unbelievably good for, say, your Gene Shielder cults, who now can arrive from Cult Ambush in Deep Strike. So it's very easy, especially if they just have a battle line unit that was like a 10-man that died. All right, cool. We're just going to Deep Strike them back into your opponent's deployment zone. So secret missions get very damn strong. So how bit how strong is it though? Let's let's talk about how big a swing. You can easily get forty points by turn five by someone who's going second on the ritual. Easily, easily. Let's say you scored five points early in the game, or heck, let's just say you scored no points early in the game. Uh, so you take the oh sorry, what was the name of the secret mission? We're gonna take. Uh, Unbroken Wall. Unbroken Wall is the one where you control three or more objective markers that are not within your deployment zone. So then you just take them. You score five. You scored five earlier in the game because I think it caps at fifteen. And then 
At the end of your round five, you go from five victory points to 40 victory points on primary because you're going to be guaranteed to score your secret mission and you're going to get the 15 primary points for holding those objectives. If we're playing take and hold, it's unbelievably easy to get 35 uh, victory points in turn five. So if you've scored five victory points in one of the other rounds, of course, of the game on primary, you have gotten 40 points on your primary there. Supply drop, super, super easy because... Uh, all you do is you just make sure that you are five points down or you're tied and then you say, Hey, I went second. So I'm going to have the advantage getting that primary at the end of the game. Anyway, I don't need to risk letting you kill me early in the game. I'll just save everything to get my, my 35 points at the end of the game by holding this one objective. 40 points on scorched earth is really, really easy. You take a secret mission, you burn your opponent's home field, all these things. Uh, 40 points on Lynchman, unbelievably easy. I already talked about that, how you can get 23 victory points on primary alone in turn five. And then if you score the secret mission, you get an additional 40 points, of course, or 20 points. Of course, that is capped at 40 because you can only get 20 on primary. So even if you get 23, it doesn't really matter. Terraform 35, Burden of Trust 34. So the point of this is what happens is your armies can more or less just look at your opponent and say, hey, listen, I'm not going to do anything in rounds one and two. I'm just going to sit here. You can't do anything about it and you can't kill me. But if you try to score any primary, I'm going to obliterate you when you expose yourself. But I'm going to do absolutely nothing because I'm just going to take a secret mission. So armies that have the easy ability to secret mission, I'm talking about your hypercrypt, your green eyes, all these things, just have a massive natural advantage and it is nonsense. So how the heck do we fix this? Because this is actually a really big problem. And I've been thinking about this quite a bit. And we were talking about this in the Discord as well. And some of the solutions that a lot of people propose just really doesn't work. So some people said, let's get rid of secret missions. Now, I think that's a really bad option because having the ability to catch up is a really, really powerful thing. And uh, I think it really helps to improve the game. Like if you get down to a early, if your opponent gets an early lead, the ability to catch up to them makes the game much more interesting and it forces people to play well. So I actually like the idea of a secret mission. Then you can say, well, we'll give more points if you're going first. Well, that's a really bad option because then you're just going to go into the opposite direction where going first is a crazy huge advantage. Now, it might not be possible to make it so that there's no advantage if you go first or second, but just giving more points for going first seems pretty bad. Um, then we have scoring at the start of the command phase in round five if you go second. Well, that's a really bad option because that just opens you up to easy counterplay because your opponents in round five, once they've scored, they just move to deny you in round five and then you can't score anything. So it also seems like a really big issue. So here's the solution that I have come up to. And I really want to hear your solution if you've actually put a lot of thought into this, because there are going to be other options that I haven't heard. But here's my, th my, my theory. Best I can come up with. Let's just say you can no longer score any primary once you select a secret mission. Done. Because what that will do is that will force you to try to score primary earlier in the game because you really, really want to get those 20 points at least early so that then you can get your 20 points for the secret mission later in the game. You can't just sit back and do nothing and let your opponent expose themselves and then in the end of the game get a guaranteed 40. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to have to at least try to play the game early. And I think this is the single best way that we can balance secret missions because the idea of secret missions are cool, but they are very, very problematic, especially when they're wrapped up with all the advantages that are inherent to prior nexus when you go second. So guys, this is the video. This is what I'm thinking about. Let me know if you like my solution. If you don't like the solution, give me your solutions. I want to hear what they are in the comments down below. Until next time, this is Happy Corrupted Wargaming, and I will catch you later. Bye-bye.